This is Ventual St. Deke, a multifaceted freelance writer, author, and editor, and world changer. But for what it's worth, I also consider her to be a master of resilience. See, in this episode, we shed light on the realities of the working poor and what it takes to overcome obstacles that many of us can relate to. My favorite being the pivotal role of community support in achieving personal growth and society change. Join us as we flip the lid and discover the power of resilience, gratitude, and human connection. Stay tuned and trust me, this is not an episode you're going to want to miss. Enjoy. Welcome back, everybody. We are back for another episode of Flipping Your Lid. And you know what we do here by now. We have just amazing, badass human beings who have crazy influence, crazy impact on the world. And today is no different. I had the pleasure of meeting this powerful woman on my live show not long ago. We had just an absolutely dynamic and deep conversation in the matter of a couple of minutes. And so to extend this to a longer format, I'm really looking forward. Ventral St. Deke is a multifaceted freelance writer, author, and editor. She also is somebody who consumes and educates and helps so many others in behavioral health in working through some of the challenges that we are all aware of. And her access to language through her own experiences just makes her so relatable. So, Venshel, I am so excited to get started with you today, my friend. How are you? I'm doing good, Brian. I'm so I'm so grateful that you brought me back on the show. <laughs> So for a longer conversation. Well, like we were talking about first thing right before we jumped in right on our last call, I had made a comment about how I was pleasantly surprised about your energy, your depth and all of the above. And my wife called out later that pleasantly surprised means that I did not know that you were going to be so amazing. But it was in contrast to the flow and energy of other elements of the show. And so we got to have a nice little laugh about that in the moment, just about, <laughs> again, stepping into ownership and communicating with clarity with each other. So. We I am in no way surprised by how much of a badass you are. Your story yeah. represents it. Your heart represents it. And I gave a very high level intro based on some of the things that you do, very little on who you are, but some of it. Uh, who are you in your words? I'm, I'm someone who I think when I think about my story, when I think about my, my career trajectory, like I'm someone who is resilient. I mean, that's one of the major adjectives that I would use to de describe myself because uh, what people don't know is that even though I was born in the States, I grew up in another country. And uh, due to the civil unrest, when I came back to the States, um, I practically raised myself at the age of 12. Um, so even if I was living with a host family, I was alone. Um, and trying to navigate not only the system of that household, but also the system, um, the U.S. healthcare system, if you will, um, and trying to navigate in a way the best the best I knew how without any level of guidance because I didn't have any sense of agency over myself in that moment. And so to me, I am someone who is extremely passionate about um, serving communities, you know, with health disparities. You know, people whose voices are not amplified in our society um, and really um, being a good steward. I think that's the whole point. Like, you know, even on your podcast, like, you know, you're not just bringing people on board to talk about their stories, but, you know, you're a good steward, too, because we are pouring our hearts to you. We're, we're sharing our stories with you. Um, and it's it, you kind of have become like a vessel, right? A vessel for us to share like our best our worst selves to, you know, the struggles that we've been through. And so that's that's how I would describe myself, someone who's resilient, someone who is determined, but also someone who's passionate about helping people who can't necessarily help themselves. Yeah. So there's a whole lot in that answer that I'm, I'm oh. going to come back to components of for sure. Yes. I want to start by having you define resilience from your perspective. Huh. From my perspective, when I think about resilience, I think about just the sheer idea of not just overcoming an obstacle per se, but I think really drawing the lessons learned and then imparting that wisdom, you know, to other people. I think that's when I think about resilient, that's that's what I think about because um, I know at the last time we were, I was talking about, you know, Chad GPT can't translate trauma. And then when I came, when I went back home and I thought to myself, you know, um, you don't necessarily have to go through a traumatic experience to be resilient. You know, it could be in the most mundane things. 
um, I consider you like a resilient person, you know, because, you know, of your story and what you were able to share, you know, on your podcast um, earlier in some earlier episodes. Um, but to me, it's really about making the best out of a situation that you didn't necessarily attract in your life. Um, making the best out of it also from the perspective of looking at what you've learned and what are some of the things that you're not going to do moving forward should that situation happen again. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the focus. And you said it twice in that answer about the lessons that need to be extracted. Yeah. Right. I often say that, you know, regardless of uh, the extremities of your stories, what's important is that you learn to pause and extract the lessons from your stories so you can become intentional in how you apply them moving forward. Right. I think there is a big difference between enduring something, right, being determined to get through something, uh, pushing through something and actually having resiliency. And I love how you set that distinction with what are we actually going to do as a result of it? Because, look, you're not resilient if you continue to go through the exact same thing time and 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 time again. Like that's not resiliency. Resiliency is growth. It's healing. It's understanding. It's wisdom. It's so much more. And so you clearly are also an extremely resilient person. I We're going to come full circle because I love that you talked about different disparities, particularly as it relates to health, Yeah. right? To actually be able to help and advocate for those who maybe don't have those situations Yeah. Uh, or, or access to resources, you know? Um, and we will come back to that in just a second, but something I don't think I knew, and maybe we talked about this before, and if we did, then, then I'm forgetting. And then I, it's like an all new story for me, but you talked about how you were born in the United States, but then you moved. And then you were back and ultimately on your own by 12. So where did you move? What was the purpose of the move? And what did that window of time in your life look like for you? So my parents thought that it would be good for me to move back to Haiti, you know, so that I could have a multilingual um, education, but most importantly, just to be grounded in my Caribbean roots because my family is from Haiti, Martinique and France. And so, um, during that time period, I have, I mean, I have nothing but good things to say. I definitely had a very happy childhood. Um, I didn't grow up in poverty, but I was surrounded by it. I'm surrounded by other people because again, just like in the United States, um, all you have to do is move from one zip code to the next. And then you can see some stark contrast between how people are living, like the, the haves and the have nots. So that was that type of, I was living in that type of situation. And so um, it bothered me, though. I think like during that time, I struggled to accept and to even embrace the privilege, to be very honest with you, because mm. I kept asking myself, well, how come the people around me do not have that? The people in the next neighborhood. And I think that's what maybe drew me to public health. And, um, you know, you're not treating people as charity. We're not here to treat people as charity cases. We're not saying like, hey, you cannot take care of yourself. But it's this whole idea of being, be, uh, being a bridge, a bridge to these resources. That's what drew me to the, the field of public health. And also that's what drew me to my um, to doing a writing, um, a setting up like a coaching writing business. Uh, because it's it's very much interlinked. It's really bringing people together and really you know sharing with them resources that maybe they may not have had access to. Um, they just just they they just didn't have the capacity to like go and and do all of the legwork and what have you for whatever reason. Um, and then also um, this is a story of coming from a place of compassion. Because there are two things that can happen. When you live in excess, like I did, and, um, you can either become a hoarder and be like, you know, it's all going to be about me, 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 me. Or are you going to say, well, I'm going to share a little bit of what I have with someone else who doesn't have it. And, I, and, I'm, so, and I'm so grateful <laughs> that my parents have always taught me about uh, doing acts of service, doing good. You know, I think even be on the on this show, like when I think about it, when I got the email, I was just like, man, like this is, you know, all of these blessings are coming in because of the good 
you know, that I continue to do, you know, and I continue to pour out into other people's lives because I want people to succeed. You know, what I have, I want you to have it too, you know, and that's coming from a place yeah. of compassion. That's coming from a place of, um, of being, uh, being a giver. That's a, that's a big one, being a giver and not a taker. Yeah. Yeah. You know, man, there's so many different directions I want to go. As you're talking, like, there's just, like, so many downloads coming in right now. Like, mm -hmm. I could take it in 15 different directions based on the depth of how you communicate. Um, I, I want to sit for just a second on this concept of privilege. Yes. And, you know, I I can sit here today and very clearly identify and recognize the privileges that I have to one, be born and live in the United States yeah. to then to be a male. Yes. And then to number three, be a Caucasian white male yep. and to recognize that there is privilege alongside all of those. And then the fourth layer of that is though we were never rich, we never didn't have what we needed. Right. Yeah. And we grew up in places where privilege was around us, even if we were not right. overly privileged ourselves mm -hmm. in comparison to our direct environment. Right. Totally so I can right. see all of this. Now, I was blind to a lot of that. What? I was unconscious to a lot of the privilege that was associated with those components for myself. I it's still you. a polarizing topic in many elements of the world today. But I realize that I have access to rooms that other people don't. Yes. Right. Now, all of that said, I also know what it's like to be the only one in the room right. because of my so, situation, right? And so does that mean that I know what it's like to be in your skin or anyone else that, that has lived life? No, I don't. But I do understand, right, what it's like to be looked at differently. I do understand what it's like yeah, to be right. underestimated. I do understand what it's like to be disconnected. I do understand what it's like to be put and shunned off to the side because I'm different, right? Despite all the privilege I have, right? Like they're not mutually exclusive. I would love to understand like your journey of understanding this concept of privilege because you identified privilege in your own world, right? And you've also been on the other side of not having privilege in moments in your life. Right. So perspective is powerful. Can you uh, take us on this journey of privilege through your lens? I would say that, so if, we, if we're gonna look at my upbringing in Haiti, uh, privilege looked like from the lens of classism, I had more than, you know, the, what people would consider the average Joe. So I went to, I went to a private Catholic school, you know, that was affiliated with, well, that's affiliated, um, still with universities in France, you know, um, it was a two income household, you know, my parents were, you know, my parents are very well traveled. I, um, you know, my father being an economist by training and my mother being a director, and she was also an economist by training. So from that perspective, I had, you know, and even, even at having access to cable, being able to go on summer vacations, like all of these components made me privileged, you know, from a money standpoint, uh, compared, you know, to some people who didn't have that opportunity. Uh, because in Haiti, when you, the simple fact that parents can send their, ch their children to private school was a non, was synonymous to being wealthy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, compared to the United States when I came here, um, you know, from, from the perspective of race. And when you look at the historical, um, you know, we, I'm not going to bore you with the historical perspectives of the time, but again, from a racial standpoint, and even the COVID pandemic, like helped us understand who was most affected by the pandemic. It was people who look like me. And then when you look at like, you know, when we were talking about the zip codes, right? Uh, because depending on the zip code, people can also determine your, your, um, your, your health level, if you will. Um, most of the fast foods, even where I am right now in Maryland, are located in yep. quote unquote poor neighborhoods. Do I consider my neighborhood poor? No. But when I walk outside, because I love to walk, um, and I see Papa Jones, <laughs> and I don't see a Trader Joe's nearby, I'm like, yeah. well, what's up with that? 
You know, and the nearest Trader Joe's, I kid you not, is probably an hour and a half away. And yeah. so now, you know, from that standpoint, privilege to me looks like, well, even right now, I'm still privileged because I can hop on an Uber. I can get mm -hmm. in a car, you know, versus someone who lives in my neighborhood. He or she may not be able to do that. Um, yeah. And so we still having this conversation on classism. We still having this conversation on uh, being educated and, and, and my education alone um, you know, puts me on a higher stratosphere. And I don't like to say that. That's I don't think that this is how it should be. I think everyone, you know, should be able to access and should be able to uh, take care of their basic needs and wants. Uh, but yes, privilege looks like this for me right now, as in uh, from an education standpoint, from a monetary standpoint, um, within, you know, within the Black community. Um, and if nothing else, I think when you're talking about being the only one in certain spaces, I know how it feels like, too, because sometimes even within my community, uh, there's also an issue of colorism. Right. And based on the way that I look, because people wouldn't automatically assume that, oh, well, you know, she's Caribbean black. It's all there's right. always this. I'm not really sure where she comes from. You know, right. and, the, and the way that I'm treated differently than, pe you know, someone who is darkest, like some of my darker skin, you know, brothers and sisters. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm very well aware of that privilege, even within the workplace. Um, you know, the, the clients that I get as well, that's another one, too. Um, I've noticed that, you know, people who look like you and I, you know, may be more, uh, may favor people like me more in terms of working with them. Um, so I think the bigger question is, do we take the time to test our assumptions? And are we falling mm -hmm. into this trap of the single story? And I think, like, I'm so glad that you talked about, you know, your awareness of your own privilege. I think that's where the real work starts, by being aware that you're being mm -hmm. treated differently than, you know, than someone else in the room, you know, who may not look like you, and really taking a stance on that. And to the best of your ability, I know I do, you know, when I feel yeah. when, like someone is not being heard or someone is giving me more t more airtime, I'm like, wait a second, but to so-and-so's point. And then it, mm -hmm. it redirects the person to say, well, maybe like I didn't, you know, maybe I need to hear a little bit more about what this person was talking about. And I think like those little things, because I do believe in a domino effect, it's just the, you know, those small little actions eventually catapult to something bigger yeah. and, and and creates a greater impact yeah and i you know it's I, I it was really beautiful to hear you talk about that through so many different layers as well it, it's it is a concept and i think that by the way everything starts with awareness yes. right? whether it's our personal internal journeys or whether it's finding ways to come together as a society to have more civil discourse to have more compassion empathy and respect for people like it doesn't matter where it starts like awareness is there and you know, there's this reason that we have this term called unconscious bias, right? And unconscious bias is often coming from places of naivety yes. and lack of exposure and experience and perspective. And I'll call direction to one very, very clearly in my own. Now, what I love is that you talked about privilege through so many different layers up to and including comparing against others within your own community that you identify with because of your Ooh, education man. or, you know, the difference in, in shade of your, of, of your skin tone, right? Yep. Like, all of that matters. I, I can tell you for myself, what started to really give me that perspective, I was 18. I was in a freshman in college. Um, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine who was from San Bernardino, a really rough area in San Bernardino in Southern California. Yeah. And um, we went to a Goodwill because we were purchasing product no. for some for project that we were working on. Yes. We get to the Goodwill and we go to just walk in and he stops me. He's wearing a backpack. I'm, I'm not. And he says, I can't, I can't go in there. And I said, what do you mean you can't go in there? Why, like, why, why, why can't you walk in the store? He goes, Brian, and this was one of the first time, and I'm getting chills as I tell the story because it's transporting me 20 years back, right? Um, but literally, it, he looked at me with just like, complete, like, I can't walk in the store, matter of fact, and I didn't even think of any issue. I was like, why? What's the problem? 
And he walked me through it. He said, Brian, if I walk in with a backpack on my back with the color of my skin in the part of town that we're in, he said, I'm going to be stared at the entire time. I could likely be accused. There may be some issue. He said, I just, I've learned, I just avoid it completely. So I said, okay, give me your backpack. I put it on my bag, on my back. And <laughs> there was like no, no issue, right? We walked in together. I had the backpack, not him. And it wasn't an issue. However, that was one of those moments that I had to ground myself and start to realize, like, I mm -hmm. never had to consider whether or not I walk into a store ever, let alone whether or not I'm actually wearing a backpack that could indicate I might be putting something into it or that it could be assumed, right? So little shifts in perspective, I think, start to open us up to places of awareness. And you've hinted at it multiple different times, and I'm like anxious, so I'm just going to jump there now, right? Your work in public health is critical. It's critical. Hmm. I have supported and done a lot of work with a lot of nonprofits. One in particular, I've done a lot of healthcare, a lot of public health stuff. And in particular yeah. with one organization that's core focus is to feed, clothe, house, and heal those that have less resources and availability. Right. And why I go there is because I also had to get really smart in both the healthcare background that I have, the clients that I was consulting with on the social determinants of health and the inequities that exist in even same cities. So I give this example because it's important, but you can translate it to Maryland or anywhere else, right? Like it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But in Phoenix, between a 10 to 15 mile difference between the south part of town and the north part of Phoenix slash Scottsdale area, there is a 20 year difference in life expectancy. You yep. talked about the food deserts that exist, right? The lack of Desert. good quality food that exists. like. Give us a little bit of insight into when you started to understand the broader issues with public health, in particular, the social determinants of health and in your education and work today, how is that evolving and where are we at, I would say, as a country and society in, in starting to actually close some of those gaps? I mean, I'm going to keep it 100% real per usual. See, that's all I expect, dude. Come on, you know that. I, Come on, we're good. I don't, think, I don't think our country is nearly close to closing this gap. I because agree. Because my, my whole thing is, and I know this is going to sound messed up, but you know, if, if people don't have problems, if there, there isn't something to solve, public health is not going to survive. So even with homelessness, when people are saying, like, we want to eradicate it completely, I always give them a little side eye because can you actually do that? Because like, and then also, too, it's a question of timing. You know, why are people taking such, you know, kind of dragging their feet to even address these issues? We're talking about food deserts and everything. But it's it's much more than that. I mean, we even talking about housing now, you know, with the gentrification where people are being pushed out of their, you know, their homes, homes that they probably bought, but they being bought out and they being shipped. I mean, I, I hate to use that word, but kind of sent to these faraway places, but even where I live, you know, and again, to be fair, Montgomery County, Maryland is one of the richest counties, including Howard County. But the thing is, is that the rent keeps coming, it keeps going up every year. And at a certain point, like I was not making enough. So in so enough money when I first came in. And so I was sort of part of this income, low income program. But then at a certain point, they kick you out because you make enough money without realizing that even when you're making enough money, like even if you're if you're in the six figure bracket or above or even slightly below it, you still living paycheck to paycheck. So technically speaking, you are a working poor. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and when we're talking about me realizing that there were some issues that, that just didn't make any sense to me in terms of uh, people not being able to afford rent and most of them looking like me. Um, and also with these food deserts is when I came to the U.S., when I realized that it was extremely hard for me to even get access to health care or, you know, being able to see a dentist or being able to get a primary care physician. Right. And even within that situation, you don't have enough people who look like me who are, you know, who mm. at the time were physicians. And so mm -hmm. you also have to look, it's a bigger discussion on looking at how medical institutions are training uh, people to sort of just like we both did in, um, in, um, in the conversation, 
think about our unconscious biases. You know, I think like when we talk about individuals behaving a certain way, we have to look at the institutions that are generating or or, yeah. or spitting out these people out into out into the wild to do the work that they that they paid to do. Um, and then ask yourself if these individuals within these institutions are taking the time to kind of unravel the the root cause of these biases, uh, which leads to these aftermath or this after effects of having these physicians sometimes not being able to, you know, take good care of people who look like me or in a way kind of they don't really know what to do with us. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. and I'm not just saying this for people who look like me, like they're also, you know, white people, too, who go through it as well. So um, and, 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 and many other things. ethnicities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I mean, I do think it's a, a universal thing. There's there's some skew, though, right? Like there's some definite skew and we see different certain certain cultures, populations, parts of the country, um, socioeconomic classes, skin color, ethnicity, all of it. Right. Like all of them, to some degree, there there is some level of skew and. We recognize that there's patterns that are creating even further divide in some places. And I, what I like and what I love about how you even answered your very first question is that you focus on the systems, right? The systems, both societal, but the systems also even down to the granular individual level. The systems are ultimately what is creating a lot of this conditioning. Give us a little bit of a feel in your personal journey, right? I know that you kind of talked a lot about kind of this shift in privilege coming from Haiti, this idea of like, I'm a giver, not a taker. Um, but I also know that you had a lot of things that you had to go through and endure and understand where you weren't in such privilege. So give us that perspective. And then I want to take the conversation a little deeper to bring this full circle. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when, when I think about the times when I wasn't, I was put in a position where I wasn't so privileged and that was probably around my college days um, when my mother came to, you know, to live permanently in the U.S. and me having to navigate the system with her. Um, I think it was it was a tough time in my life because I think that once again, like, you know, when you're when I've lived since I've lived in so much excess, like it was kind of hard for me to realized that I was sort of limited in some ways to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, I think at a certain point, I kept thinking to myself, well, if I don't have enough money, am I ever going to be able to accomplish my dreams and goals? Because initially, like I wanted to become a doctor. I wanted to become um, a, a medical doctor, a pediatrician and work with children. But then I quickly realized that what I, what I wanted to do um, in terms of taking care of population health was not aligned with, you know, case management work. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also think that during that time, too, I created a bubble. I, I created a bubble for myself so that I wouldn't be reminded that I was operating from a place of lack in that or, or, or around that time. And I think also that's probably where I started cultivating this whole idea of gratitude. Like, yes, I didn't have a lot of money, but then, you know, I always had food on the table. You know, um, I still had a parent who was working um, because at the time my father was getting a degree. You know, I still, I didn't, you know, at the time, like, you know, at, you know, when I didn't have my parents around, um, you know, there was also like a sense of abandonment. And I think that's where, like, I learned about nurturing relationships and cultivating relationships. But the problem with cultivating relationships um, along the journey, like as someone who didn't have a sense of agency over herself at the time and who had to figure things out, is that sometimes people don't have your best interests at heart. Uh, sometimes people are not able to, you know, they were themselves accountable for the things that they do to you, you know, especially the not so good experiences. Um, and it was just it was just a tough time. I um I was down on myself constantly, um, just because I, I just didn't see a way out. And I think like sometimes people who go through poverty, maybe that's how they feel too. There's no way out. And the system that at the time when I first came to the US, 
didn't make it any easier to find these outlets, you know, to kind of, you know, they would just, just kind of have a plan of action. You know, they would think like that's, 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 that pretty much sums up like what, how I felt at the, during that time. I just didn't have, I was not equipped with a plan of action. I didn't have the resources around me to get me to that point. You know, there was, so you, you know, there was, you know, out, there was, right? I did not. Yet you, yet you, know, you there got was, out. You know, there was, so what was the turning point? You know, there was, 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 I think it's, it's through that one relationship that I had at the time, you know, when there was this woman who saw something in me and then she was the one who was able to kind of help me navigate, you know, the whole school system. Because again, even in the U.S., they didn't have classes at the time where people spoke my language because I'm a native French speaker. Um, and, and my English at the time was not, uh, was not that great. Um, so I was, I was struggling for sure when I first came, came here and she was the one who sort of took me under her wings and then just, um, showed me a route out, connected me to people, helped me with my like college applications. If I had questions, like she was there to answer these questions. Um, and then she was the one who really helped me, um, my situation at the time was still the same, but she provided like a, an escape, an escape, um, you know, there was, you know, for me to just kind of lay low and be myself and really try to figure out, okay, what the next steps were going to be. You know, there was, 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 one. You know, there was, 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 what has you know, this there was, kind of path you know, there was, of you know, there was, you know, there was, like you know, there was, you know, there was, when and you know, there was, 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 that's a very good question. I have always had some trouble um, learning how to receive, you know, from people until maybe five years ago when I realized that just like, you know, a dialogue, it's a give and take. And so if I'm out here always giving, 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 it doesn't allow space, you know, for this person to show me who he or she is. Well, what they're capable of doing. I think sometimes for people like me who like to, you know, take initiative and we like to go out there and make an impact, sometimes we have to stop. And I think that's where self-reflection comes into play. You have to hold, I, I've had to hold myself accountable and save and show, you know, there's nothing wrong with giving to someone, but you also have to give them a chance, you know, give them a uh, Create some space, you know, for them to breathe, for them, for them to breathe, you know, positivity into you, for them to, you know, you know, treat you out to dinner or something like that. Um, and that's the issue, too. Even now that I think about it, when I look at my life, you know, from Haiti to the States, there were people being put in each season of my life to give me something. But the thing is, in that during that time, you know, so we're talking about from twelve until my teenage years. I don't, I didn't feel like I had something to give other than my time, other than me being a good listener. But there's also that comes a place in that there came a, a place in my life where I had to also say to myself, okay, now that people have poured out all of these resources 
onto me, I have a responsibility to carry on their legacy. And so my legacy is to give back to my mentees and then also bring people along with me when I'm going somewhere. Um, and even in that conversation, you have to be selective because you can't, that's one lesson I've learned in life. You can't bring everyone with you in each season. You have to, <laughs> you have to listen to yourself and it's not good or bad. I mean, there's some people, they probably were amazing to you, but for whatever reason, their role will be rendered in the, uh, inefficient and, uh, will be rendered inefficient in the next season of your life. You know, you may need to be connected to someone else. Um, and that's how I look at life. I look at life from a believer's perspective. I feel like when the universe or when God puts you in a situation, it's like he gives you a package. You know, it has the people, the situations, the challenges that you're going to go through. Um, because, you know, he, you know, the universe doesn't give you what you cannot handle. I, I sincerely believe that. And it makes you a better person yeah. in the end. How you would have you describe to, the you current have season? To, in you, your have life? To, you have to, you have to, you have to, the current season, right now, you're finding me in the desert season. So the desert season is a very tricky place to be because it almost feels like nothing is moving. I know things are moving beneath the surface, but it's not readily visible. And I think that's where faith comes into play. Some t you have to believe in what is not yet seen. Um, you have to have, you have to have enough faith to understand that everything is going to happen at the right time. So had you told me, you know, four or five years ago that I was going to be featured on different podcasts, I would have said, I would have just laughed and I would have been like, nah, you are definitely tripping. But uh, because at the time, I didn't know if I even had a story to tell. But with time, with self-reflection, and then with, with patience, um, and then through the unraveling of how trauma has informed my past actions, how it no longer informs my current actions, you realize, okay, I have something to share with people. And, um, and, and, and I think, like, you know, this pretty much sums up, like, what we talked about, um, about what I just said earlier about really believing in the things not yet seen. You know, everything shows up when you're ready, when you're ready to take action on it. And that's yeah. what happened. You have to, you have to, I believe the you have, is always perfect you have, to, allow you have, it, to, right? it's yeah, just really difficult sometimes. You have, to allow. you have, to, you have, to, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and allow doesn't mean you like have to, do nothing. You have, to, right? you have, but, to, but it is, you it is something that can be very you have to, challenging. You have, to, 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 and you have yet today you you have 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 when did writing become a passion and an outlet for you and your life you have you have what do you see in your work today to be some of the bigger blocks that exist in people's ability to step into your own stories whether it's you have you have you have you have you have you have I think for me like writing became an an outlet you know when um when I was living in the states and when I I didn't have people at the time to really talk to about my problems um because seeing your parents every now and, you know, not every now and then, but every year, was, it's not the same as living with them. And so I think that journaling gave me an opportunity to sort of make sense of the world around me. And then also, like, it makes sense of the internal strife that I was going through. And I'm a firm believer that, you know, when you become a teenager, those are very sensitive years. Like, you know, people are really trying to find themselves. And I definitely felt lost. And so um, I think you know, by really taking the time to do an assessment, you have to know my own life. And then coming into contact with other clients who are coming in with different stories. They're like also in different spectrums in terms of the writing level. I had to say to myself, okay, each time I work with a client, I try to think to myself, okay, if I'm working with a novice, you have to, where, you know, I think of the first time when I, I bought my first journal and then I started writing, putting things down. And um, 
I try to help my clients understand that the the story, like the when they write their stories, it doesn't have to be perfect the the first time around, because memory also can be flickering. You have to, and sometimes when we're talking about seasons, you have to allow your writing to sit for a while uh, before returning to it and really trying to make sense of, you know, what happened back then and then doing some reflection on how, whether or not it's still affecting you now and how it's affecting your future of deemed relevant. Um, but really giving time to time for the story to unfold, because even when I write myself, um, I think that each sentence is a story. It's almost like a conversation. Um, I can't really explain it <laughs> like I would have to do it in front of you. But when I'm writing, I'm always um, I'm always asking myself, like, what is the story that I'm trying to tell? And it also to am I com- coming from a place of a victor or am I coming from a place of being a victim? That's another good one, too, because based on the way that you see yourself in that moment, the narrative changes, the protagonist yeah, and the antagonist changes. Like when I. Even when I'm reflecting on the conversation that we're having right now, I don't see myself as a victim. I think if not, I, I don't even know if I even see myself as a victor as well, but I see myself as someone who was thrown a lemon and I had to just find a way to not just make lemonade, but key lime pie and some lemon bars too, <laughs> you know? And then also, even though as painful as it was at the time, in retrospect, I look at these different facets of my life and I'm amazed. I'm amazed that not only I got, I was able to see a way out of the tunnel, but also too that it didn't make me bitter. It made yeah. me better. Um, and I think that's what my clients get to experience all the time. Um, I'm able to see right through them, but I'm also able to see above the story too. When they're talking to me, when I'm reading what they they send to me, I'm able to see the blind spots, some things that they may have missed when they started writing the story. So, um, so yes. Part of resilience is resourcefulness. And by the way, if you actually make key lime pies or lemon bars, I need to figure out a way to get you to mail one to me because those are two of my favorite things on the planet. Uh, yes. And yeah. Oh my goodness. I am like, I'm a sucker for, for both of those. You know, you, you've talked a lot and I know that we've only got a few minutes left here, but you've talked a lot about obviously wanting to make sure that you're a resource to bring others along who haven't had the same privileges, the same access to things as you, right? That you, as you grow, as you develop. And again, you said it very early on too, even with your education, it's not a hierarchy thing. It's an evolution thing. And you're just trying to make sure that others have the chance to evolve and move alongside with you. Yes. So you're pulling a lot of people along with you. You have a lot of people who rely on you. You have a lot of people who come to you for support, guidance, support. What are you currently working on and who do you go to to pull you along? Oh, um, I think now that I have a little bit more wisdom um, than I had before um, when I started off this journey, the person I usually go to for advice and sound guidance is my father. You know, he's like one of my best friends. Um, I don't take his time for granted. I don't take the guidance for granted. Um and, and and I know that, and I think that's part of building relationships. You're not always going to get it right. I don't, you know, he is not my expectation and I'm not his expectation. We come as whole and complete human beings and we have, you know, these adult, like we have like, like the conversations we're having right now. And I think like, that's the beauty also like, you know, working for my side business and even in public health. Is understand is to stay humble, you know, and to understand that the wisdom is really that you know nothing, you know, and and and, and you know nothing. Uh, things are constantly changing, people constantly evolving, and I think the best advice is to always listen more and talk less. And that's one of the things I've been able to do with my dad when I need when I need advice. Um, I also have a good friend of mine who lives in Georgia. I usually call her and we hash things out. Uh, because for me, when I talk to people, 
we don't necessarily have to relate. They don't necessarily have to have gone through what I went through. Um, sometimes you may just need someone to say, hey, you're not alone. Like, you know, you you may feel like this is unique to you, but this is not unique to you. There are billions. You're yeah. one of 8 billion people who are going through that. Um, and that's what I'm able to get from my friend, um, you know, in Georgia and then my father. These These are the people. And then also my brother, too. Uh, but my brother is like 10 years younger than, than I am. Um, and so the conversation looks a little bit different because it's it's kind of like he's living his life vicariously through me. Like he's seen 10 years before, him, you know, and, and yeah. that can be a little yeah. scary. Um, yeah. and, um, and this is where, you know, you have to meet people where they are. And that's what I try to do and the work that I do in public health. Uh, when we're talking about social determinants of health, I don't believe... Um, not one bit that we're close to solving this problem. Uh, but as long as we keep taking the step, I mean, isn't that the idiom, you know, uh, the journey of a thousand steps It <laughs> starts with, yep. yeah. So, the journey of a thousand miles begins thousand with the very first step. With the yep. very first step. And so as long as I continue to keep moving forward and keep expanding my horizon, keep questioning things, and getting to the root cause of issues, um, I may not be able to solve, you know, all of these problems at once, but maybe I could find, I could get closer to my mission statement and my vision statement. Yeah. I could get closer to what I really am here to do on this earth before I graduate from life. So, yeah. yeah. Eventually, my friend, I know that we're tied on time and I just want to say thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your stories, your lessons, and ultimately your heart, just bringing it all together for us. Oh. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And those of you that just watched Ventral St. Dick open and flip her lid. She told us about the stories. She told us about the resilience. She told us about the moments that she was disconnected, those in her life who've helped her, guided her, the purpose and drive for why she's wanting to do the same thing for you. And ultimately, if you look at what she just said in that last answer, you're not alone. See, we all go through these things. We all experience these things. And ultimately, we're really just one heartbeat away from another person. It is going to require you to open yourself up, which means you're going to have to flip open your lid and scan your can. What you can probably tell by now is that I love telling these stories, but what I love even more is the impact that's coming from them. You see, we're on a mission to impact over a billion lives as quickly as possible, but to do that, we need you. See, we believe that moved people move people. And so all I'm asking is if you've resonated, connected with any of the messaging, please consider like, commenting, sharing, leave a rating and review. Thank you so much for tuning into Flipping the Lid. And if you want more information on the show, how to become a guest, how to recommend a guest, or any of the other details, head over to flippingthelid.com. We'll see you there.